Halo, halo, witamy serdecznie dziś ze studia w G2 Arena. Prowadzimy konferencję z Australią, drodzy Państwo. Inicjatywa Kongres 60 milionów z wiadomych przyczyn przeniosła się do świata internetu. Drodzy Państwo, Halo 60 milionów, Halo People to formaty, które już prowadzimy od trzech tygodni dla Państwa. Mieliśmy Hiszpanię, mieliśmy połączenie z Wielką Brytanią, ze Stanami Zjednoczonymi, dziś Halo Australia. Łączymy się z jak dla nas najbardziej oddalonym od Rzeszowa miejscem na świecie. To pokazuje, że Polonia jest na całym globie i że warto się integrować i zjazd, globalny zjazd Polonii realnie ma również miejsce w tych trudnych czasach. Drodzy Państwo, ja w G2A Arena występuję tylko w roli konferencjera, aby, aby przywitać Państwa i zaprosić na konferencję, którą dziś z Australii poprowadzi Pani Ewa Husain, którą witamy również bardzo serdecznie. Witam Panią e, Pani Ewo. E, konferencja dziś będzie poprowadzona w języku e, angielskim, natomiast dla Państwa informacja, że transkrypcja z językiem polskim będzie udostępniona w niedalekiej przyszłości i będzie można ją również odsłuchać e, w, z tłumaczeniem na język polski. A ja już w tym momencie, aby nie przedłużać, przekazuję głos do Australii. Dziękuję serdecznie Panie Krzysztofie i przejdziemy teraz na język angielski. So um, I'm probably one of the biggest fan of, um, of the initiative of the 60 million Congress. I've been to four. Um, the last one I went to was in Miami earlier this year. So um, I was actually planning to be out there to attend all of them from Chicago to Toronto to Rzeszów, but um, it didn't happen. So what I did want to say though is a big thank you for the initiative. Um, Look, it's, a, it's an amazing um, uh, event um, that gathers together people from all over the world. Um, and I wanted to take our heads off to the organizers, to Kamil, Bartosz, Zbigniew and Grzegorz for their vision and how it works. Uh, it isn't easy to connect um, the Polish diaspora. There are 60 million of us. Um, and it's a really genuine, you know, fantastic effort. So thank you for making this happen. Um, The reason that we're running this event in English is this, that um, there are 60 million of us. So 38 million um, Poles living in Poland and uh, around 20 million outside of Poland. And many of them do not speak uh, Polish well. Um, so we're trying to um, you know, expand our horizons and include people that feel Polish but might, may not speak the language um, as well as, as you know, um, people in Poland do. And there are also people that are not Polish that are very interested in this initiative. So, you know, people married to Poles, people doing business in Poland, people studying in Poland. So this is why we're doing this um, in English. Um, what I also wanted to say is to thank the organizers for moving this event online. And it's, it's so challenging, it's so difficult when you have your whole year planned ahead and then something like um, COVID happens. Um, so I think it's, um, It's a, it's a fantastic way of connecting. And because we are hoping to bring uh, this event to Australia, perhaps in 2021, um, at least it'll give us a taste of what it's like. So a little bit about Australia. Um, it's a very unique and diverse uh, country. There's about, nobody really knows how many, but there's roughly about 150,000 uh, people of Polish origin. So those born in Poland and those that may have Polish heritage. Um, It's the sixth biggest country in the world. Um, and, um, you know, we speak about 300 languages here. So those of us that live here, they, they are aware of this and they're quite comfortable with it. But uh, when, when you hear about that, I, I think it, it changes people's perspective um, about what Australia is. As far as our population, I, I've looked it up. So let, let me tell you, there is currently 25,499,884 people in Australia. So just under 20, 26 million, so not that many. Um, and it's a, you know, it's a very big continent. It's a very big country. Um, what is Australia famous for? Many, many things. Um, but for Polish people, there are two things that we, we, um, we are proud of. One is uh, Mount Kosciuszko, uh, which we always, always, always correct people on. It's pronounced Kosciuszko. The other one is, uh, Czeslecki Rangers, and it is pronounced Czeslecki. Let me tell you, but there's some real tongue twisters there. So watch this space. Anybody that's watching uh, us right now that hasn't been to Australia, come and visit. 
Um, today we talking to us from two cities. Uh, one's Melbourne, the other one's Sydney. It's already 10 p.m. Uh, and we scheduled it in such a way that we can maximize the, maximize the reach and people from all over the world can uh, can watch us, watch us, I guess. Um, and, you know, we have been through some turbulent times. We're going to be talking about agility and we're going to be talking about resilience and we're going to be talking about um, leadership in challenging times. So um, these are the topics that um, we want to explore. So I'll tell you a little bit more about myself. I, I was born in Thailand and immigrated to Australia in 1985 by France. I've lived here ever since. I do go back to Poland quite, quite, quite a lot. Um, I founded and I manage a company called Polaron. We do translations, um, interpreting, and we also help people reclaim European citizenship. We have offices in Melbourne, in um, New York, in London, and in Woods, uh, which is where I come from. Um, now, I have also been involved in quite a few um, Polish diaspora initiatives. I was on the board of um, Polish Community Council of Victoria. And currently, I am on the board of Australian Society of Polish Jews. Um, so very quickly moving on about the panel. I don't know about you, but I, uh, you know, I am online a lot at, at the moment, and I'm hearing all kinds of stuff from all kinds of places and all kinds of words that I don't really understand, to be honest. So we're talking about pivoting, and we're talking about agility, and we're talking about um, flexibility, and all kinds of things. So um, you know, I think it's really hard to get your head around about, uh, you know, some of those topics. So luckily we have a, a, a very esteemed panel, which I'll introduce everyone to shortly, um, of people that have something to say about what's happening to us. They're fabulous, fabulous presenters, and it's an all women's panel, but uh, we're not going to be discussing women's issues. Uh, we're going to be talking and sharing expertise um, because we have that expertise. It's got nothing to do with the agenda. Uh, yes, we are women. Yes, we do have a different perspective perhaps, but we want to share what we know, um, you know, with everyone. So let me uh, introduce our esteemed panelists. The first person is um, our Consul General, um, Dr. Monika Konczuk. And I'll tell you a little bit about, um, um, we were wondering what to call her, so we're going to call her Pani Consul because we, we can't call her by her first name, or I can't anyway. Um, so um, Pani Consul Monika Kończyk holds a PhD in law, um, and she also has a master's, she's got a two master's degree, once in English philology and once in biology, and she um, used to be a teacher. But prior to taking up uh, her position uh, in Sydney, um, she um, was the Pomeranian Chief Education Officer, and she's also been involved um, in uh, National Section of Education on, of NZZ Solidarność, and a member of the European Trade Union Committee for Education. Um, she is a highly uh, ac accomplished educator, and for her exceptional services, she was honoured in 2018 by, um, uh, you know, she, she received a medal for of the Commission of National Education, and then, sorry, that was not in 2018, 2018 Dr. Kontrick received the Silver Cross of Merit for her outstanding contribution in the educational space and community initiatives. Um, Pani Consul speaks three languages, not just English and Polish, but also Russian, and she is a proud mother of a daughter and a son. Uh, the next person I'm going to introduce to you is uh, Dr. Anna Voigt. Um, she is a director at PwC Australia. Uh, Anna is also the global PwC shared service and outsourcing chief of staff. Um, she has over 17 years experience in leading transformation programs in Europe, Middle East, Africa, US, Australia, South East Asia and New Zealand. Um, as a global e leader, she draw, drives development of PwC methodologies and tools, um, leads PwC research and assesses global shared services and outsourcing trends. Um, Anna has advised clients on building and leading teams around the world. She holds a PhD in political science and international relationships and is a member of the Australian Institute of Company Directors. 
Um, I know Anna quite, quite well, and I can tell you that she is a doer uh, and one of the hardest working people you will ever meet. Um, and someone that really inspires others and certainly inspires me. Uh, below Anna on your screen, you can see Lucena or Lucy Dimorschbach. Um, she's a teacher, she's a tertiary teacher, uh, also somebody I know personally. Um, and she works with um, international students who are preparing for their university courses. So, you know, some major disruptions in that area. Um, at the moment, um, Lucena works um, uh, at Monash College in Melbourne, but she has worked as a teacher in Poland and in Australia or in Europe for almost 20 years. She's also, um, if you don't know this, an ARCHI certified professional interpreter, and she's very involved uh, with the Polish community in Melbourne. She moderates um, the largest Polish community social media group in Melbourne, um, and she also organizes you know, events um, for new Polish migrants, for students, and Polish, living, uh, Polish women living in Melbourne. She's a mom of two amazing kids. She, she told me to say that in case the kids are watching. Um, the next panelist is Aga Steinschniak. Um, she has 20 years of professional experience in international marketing and business development, which she gained while living and working in, listen to this, seven countries, three continents and two islands. And she's gonna tell us about those islands, I'm sure. Um, so she's held a um, managerial position in uh, industry that's dominated by men. So we're very, very keen to hear from, uh, from Aga. She's lived in Japan, uh, where she's worked um, in an IT company, one of the biggest ones. And she has, would you believe it, five business degrees. Um, and her motto is, nothing her is motto impossible. is, <laughs> nothing is impossible. Today, Alga lives in Sydney. Uh, the next person we have um, to introduce is Monica Furman. Uh, Furman. Um, she's a barrister at the Victorian Bar, um, and she specialises in commercial and prosecutions work. With focus, her focus is employment law. Um, in 2019-2020, Monica was recognised in the Lawyers Weekly Annual Awards as one of Australia's top barristers under 30. Um, she is also the president of one of the biggest, if not the biggest, uh, Polish festival in the world which is a Polish festival at Fed Square. It's a non-profit organization and she's responsible for running it. Uh, it is now in its 16th year, so a really well established uh, institution. Every year around 50,000 people uh, attends the festival and not just Polish people. Um, Monica's grandparents were born in Poland, so we, we um, when we hear her speak po Polish, it's, it's, um, it's so um how, you know it's so touching um that she, she's able to do that it's just really beautiful her grandparents came to australia after the war and now least last but not least we have bettina Skudladek. uh i'm just getting her up on the screen so i can see hello um bettina is an associate professor in management at the university of sydney uh sydney business school um, her um, interests or core research interests lie in the intersection of cross-cultural management, international HRM, and I'm sure you'll tell us what HRM stands for, and management of diversity. So her work has been uh, published in many, many uh, journals and uh, international publications. Um, and she's worked on a number of different uh, multinational um, with number of uh, multinational corporations on developing intercultural competence and fostering global leadership excellence. Uh, the other thing I should tell you about Bettina is that beyond her academic uh, commitments, she holds the post of strategic sustainability and growth consultant with the United Nations Alliance of Civilization. So as you can see, um, you know, quite a prominent um, and very well chosen uh, panel members, if I uh, may say so myself. Um, so what I'm going to do now is hand over to our first panelist. Uh, but before I do, I, I wanted to say that um, there are many, many things that drive change. Um, and we are, I think all of us right now, the entire you know, population of Earth, uh, we're going through probably one of the biggest changes and biggest challenges um, that we have um, 
undergone as a generation. And I think it's fair to say that we don't know how it's going to pan out. We don't know what's going to happen. Um, and this turbulence that we're seeing, it, it is experienced differently uh, for all kinds of reasons. Um, and it varies from individuals to groups. Um, so with that, um, what I wanted to do is hand over to Pani Consul Monica and um, ask uh, her um, simply, how are you going at the moment? Because being a diplomat, I think um, um, you must have been uh, under the pump in the recent weeks. How, how have, you, uh, have you found it tough? How, how are you going? Uh, first of all, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to uh, be a part of uh, a huge 60 million Congress. That's a great challenge for me. I think that I will manage to answer your question. First of all, uh, let me start by saying that nobody was prepared for the pandemic times. Uh, furthermore, some known crisis strategic business, I think, strategic proce uh, procedures can be uns unsatisfactory. Uh, in my opinion, we need to think relatively fast, no one day, how to deal with pandemic uh, biological crisis. We need to rethink our style of working, living, and so on. And it's a huge challenge and challenge with our professional and personal lives and uh, dealings. Personally, I hate self-isolating. I love people. I love meeting with people, talking to people. I'm a talkative person. And um, as a consul general, one of the, my main tasks is to build a network of contacts within Polish community, uh, not only, but my main uh, purpose is like that, and to be present at many events. Uh, so now my character of my job has changed drastically. Uh, I've started doing far more online conferences, telephone conversation, mail conversation, uh, and uh, with, with uh, people and with other consuls because we have the special consul network here. Uh, definitely, I try to focus on positive way of thinking and dealing with my employees because I am a boss as well. Uh, and uh, they help me a lot during these difficult times. But on the other hand, I worry about my family. Uh, my daughter, uh, she was to visit me in April and she couldn't. And my mom, 75, living in Poland. And uh, so 60,000 kilometers far from me. So on one hand, I'm worrying about my present um, job or work or uh, activities. On the other hand, I'm, I also think about my family. And uh, what I would like to say something about the character of a job that we all consular uh, officers doing uh, now, because of the sanitary restrictions and the state and national border closure, we, the consular corps representatives need to assist Polish people, Polish tourists uh, who desperately want to come back to Poland, to home country. Uh, fortunately, in March and April, uh, the Polish government or with the Polish uh, airlines organized two special uh, chartered uh, flights, Sydney, Warsaw. All the time we try to inform our citizens about all potential transport options via special platform of the Seuss. It's a very important platform, but not so many people know about it. Via, via social media, we are present at Twitter and very active. And uh, our official webpage is uh, systematically uh, updated. We answer hundreds of mails, even during the night, and hundreds of calls, even during the night. So honestly, Although we are all humans, we work 24 hours uh, per day during the seven day week. 
And uh, what we observe, and I observe, that uh, Polish tourists, Polish people, have huge uh, uh, expectations and they demand our consular assistance even uh, with organizing uh, individual plane tickets to Poland. Therefore, we need to deal with their frustrations, anger, accusations. Believe me, it's a great job and challenge for me and my team. That's why we try to be well prepared. This is another part of our job in this difficult time. So um, we all necessary, uh, we prepare all necessary uh, legal because we deal with international law, Australian law, Polish law. So we try to be, uh, to prepare in advance some solutions that I am um, uh, well prepared because of the law. We cooperate with many institutions, including Home Affairs in Australia, uh, airlines, um, Qatar Airlines, for example, consular corps. We have, we have very active consular network among other consul, uh, consuls generals. We, uh, t sometimes we solve the problems of our citizens. Uh, I have prepared the special info with short specific notes to help us responding to numerous questions. I also prepared the special letters addressed to Polish communities, Polish school, parents and uh, students about online learning and uh, educational materials. Uh, I also think about new recordings uh, to be on a video or YouTube because as you can see, I want, I wish to be present even on the computer screen. This is my job now. So not only be present on the events, but be present on the computer screen. So waiting for the post virus <laughs> at times, I developed new ways to get in contact with people here in Australia and of course in Poland. I try to be active member of all networks, including co co um, consular ones, and Zoom meetings, uh, YouTube meetings, Skype meetings, and WhatsApp group. So nowadays my job transferred to uh, online job, but uh, we are open. Uh, our um, uh, consulate in um, Canberra and um, uh, embassy in Canberra and consulate in Sydney, we are still open. Uh, and it's uh, really challenging because other consul uh, generals, they told me during the meeting of other European uh, Union countries that they are not open. We are open, we work during the day, we accept people with their problems. Uh, we deal uh, with normal consular uh, assistance. And believe me, during the night, we answer the phones. So That's it's really quite... challenging. Yeah, yeah, it sounds really full on actually. What I was going to do now is hand over to Anna uh, there in the left hand corner. And um, what, what I was hoping to ask you, Anna, is what are some of the challenges you have faced, um, but not just challenges, what do you see as opportunities in this landscape that's so, uh, you know, perhaps confusing and there's a lot of anxiety and, um, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty. Could you share some, some of your points of view, views with, with us, please? Um, good morning, good afternoon and good evening to everyone. <laughs> and thank you, Eva, for inviting me. As always, it's so fantastic to join such a beautiful group of ladies, um, so smart and so intelligent. I'll try to um, somehow to share my own experience. I think I will start at that um, 2020 would be probably remembered by all of us as one of the most difficult years for Australia. We started the year with uh, tremendous bushfires. We had amazing and absolutely detrimental floods that destroyed a lot of our houses. And in March, uh, 
coronavirus has reached out our homes. I think we all, at, at somewhere at the end of March, we were probably done with the year and very ready to uh, start 2021. But it's still yep. a few months in front of us. I think the one thing that are, for me personally, in those times which are so difficult, um, the one of the most complex is um, anxiety and stress, which is so related to unknown um, and uncertain times that are in front of us. For me, who spends probably most of her life traveling around the world and spending six to eight months outside of Australia, I found actually a great pleasure that finally I can stay at home. So for me personally, those opportunities are in three things. The one is to rediscover home, to discover my friends and family around, to actually have time to go for a coffee and meet the person who makes that coffee and have a, just a simple chat and getting to know my neighbors. I think the second thing that is very important for me and I found is a great pleasure is to rediscover time itself, have a time for reflection, have a time to uh, look on where we are, what we do, and really appreciate tiny little small things like um, a walk. Um, today, probably in the massive rain because we had a lot of rains, which we cherish and we're very grateful for. Um, and the last thing, I think um, I feel that in every challenge, um, in every crisis, there is an opportunity. And for me, that opportunity is in learning. I think it is a, such a great opportunity for us to upskills. You've mentioned that there's a lot of words in, in internet called, you know, about agile and digital and whatever we call it. But the truth is, uh, regardless of COVID-19, we are on the edge of the fourth um, industrial revolution. And that revolution is coming if we want or not. It means that the technology that we are using today, being able to connect with 60 millions, um, it is around us. And I um, wanted to use that time to learn more, to rediscover more, to think about how can I be more connected with my teams? How can I support my clients in a better way? And how can we reinvent what we're doing on a regular basis? So Anna, tell me, with that in mind, and you do manage a lot of people, um, how, how has that affected your team? And um, could you maybe say, you know, I guess share some ideas about how to uh, inspire or motivate or support people that you work with? Um, it's a good one, right? Because uh, in, in the past, and I think before COVID, the way of us uh, managing the teams was to uh, travel to those different parts of the world, meet them in person, um, and spending hours and hours moving from one place to another. Uh, today, um, this is impossible, but I think I spend more time with them actually dedicating the time to meet them as a person. And what I really cherish is using the technology to be more connected, but not on a work basis, but really on a personal basis. I uh, really enjoy that, you know, today you are, have a sneak peek to my kitchen and you can see what is behind uh, my back. Um, and that's allowed us to really be reconnected. And one, probably the biggest advice for me um, and what I'm trying to encourage everyone is to use that time, not only to move the business, but predominantly to dedicate that time to meet the people around us, um, to spend some time with them, to get to know them, to understand their situation, but also have a little bit fun. I mean, what I do with my teams, we would have a Thursday drinks or we would have a morning virtual coffee. Um, and regardless of if we are together or not, try to cherish those moments that allowed us to stay better connected and as they work together in a slightly different way. Thank you, Anna. I'll um, switch over to Bettina because the question that I have for you and, and you, you do specialize, that's one of the things that you, you, um, you, know, you specialize in is leadership. So what I wanted um, to do is for you to um, frame it within the last two months. What sort of leaders are we seeing are they agile? Are they resilient? Have they fallen into a heap? Um, what are you observing? What are you seeing? Could you maybe tell us a bit more about that? That's a very good question and I'm very happy to be able to talk about it uh, in such an excellent company. So thank you for inviting me. Um, we, we are pondering upon this leadership issue 
and what is an effective leadership in today's world and today's situation. And we literally um, just got uh, an expertise of you know, numerous leadership scholars and practitioners to reflect what they think. And the interesting thing we discovered is it's very difficult to predict what is really the one recipe because sometimes it might be a matter of almost you know, some type of luck. Because when you know, Scott Morrison in Australia closed the borders, despite the advice from you know, the World Health Organization and all the other bodies, everyone was saying what's going on and what type of leadership is that? Is it more populism rather than leadership? Now everyone is turning to Australia saying maybe that was the best thing that saved lives. Now, three months from now, we don't know what's going to happen. Will there be you know, possibility mm. that Australia hasn't built the herd immunity that other countries have? And, and you know, we are going to face another problem. Nobody knows. So there is a lot, of, mm. a, a lot of flexibility that we see, a lot of humility that we see among leaders who can admit that they were not right, that they don't know everything, that there are people smarter than themselves who might possess the knowledge they need. Um, and there is a lot and a lot of empathy. So I think the leaders that we see being praised are, are those who understand the fears that might be happening. And those fears are different in different countries and different circumstances. And they really relate to people and their perspectives and, and build a you know, realistic preview, but full of hope of what the future can look like and mobilize people not by fear, but by you know, future of vision of future that is hopeful and links to whatever the fears that you know the people might be having. And what about trust? Um, I mean, you know, on a scale from one to a hundred, I guess leaders, uh, depending on the context, but let's say politicians aren't up there. Um, but I think that there's uh, quite 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 a few notable examples of people that have really stepped up, and you know, I guess Australia's prime minister's one. Uh, where, um, you know, it's not a popularity contest, it's about people's lives and people's safety and, you know, really tough decisions that, um, you know, one, one in a lifetime, I guess, or, or um, do you think we trust our leaders more or are, are we looking for that leadership, whether it's at work or, or in other uh, contexts um, where we, we just want to trust the leaders and, and, and believe in what they say? I think this is such a you know, new novel situation in which we found ourselves that we have no other choice but find some more source of, you know, of where we can rely on some type of knowledge and, and expertise and, and uh, reference point that we can rely on because we know so little about what is happening. And what's more important, while it happens, our own perspective change, uh, which is another skill that, you know, the leaders will need. And I think being able to admit that one might have been wrong builds a lot of that trust that is necessary for us to trust those leaders uh, as we move along, which is still a very unpredictable situation. So I feel mm. like some leaders created an amazing response. And of course, we, you know, we all know uh, uh, who they are in, in a kind of international scale with uh, 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 you know, New Zealand probably being praised the most strongly. Uh, but we also see that some leaders are not doing that great. And, and there is a little bit of, you know, of an ignorance and, and the assumption that I'm bigger than anything. So I find that again, that element of humility is really necessary. And you know, one of the things which we are reflecting upon in this new context is that whether any situation, especially such a global problem like the one we are facing, should, we should re reframe our thinking about leadership from one individual to a collective effort. Because while there might be one voice whom we hear talking in the you know, press conference, the amount of knowledge, expertise, perspectives that you know, contributed to that is probably much more than that one leader who mm. then gets to speak out that one talk you know, uh, once a week on yeah, TV. So I think the notion of collective so leadership is something that we should recognize more strongly. Mm. And um, just a bit close, closer to your own backyard, because you work at a very big university. What, what's happening in your world? Um, what's the leadership like there? I think, you know, it's very, in some way, entertaining to watch it from a perspective of an insider, where we are supposed to teach about, as you say, agility and all those fancy words, and then facing it ourselves and realizing, wow, are we so agile ourselves? And how can we respond to that? I have to say that the university uh, as a community have really 
stood up to the challenge extremely well. And under the circumstances in which everyone's workload has increased tremendously, uh, the, you know, the financial conditions might have been impacted. Uh, everyone needed to move, or many of us had to move to homeschooling. I found that flexibility levels were extremely high and everyone's willing to you know, contribute to everything that is happening to make it a success. Mm -hmm. So I think from that perspective that has worked really well. From the perspective of students, I think there is still a lot that you know, we can and we should do because I think mm -hmm. the of social isolation on many of those young people who moved you know, all over the world to live a beautiful dream in Australia, for some of them, that's not the reality they are living. So we are still going to mm -hmm. see the mental the health mental health consequences of this situation. Right, thank you. Aga, what were the two islands that you lived on? I'm dying to, to learn. <laughs> right, obviously one was the Scotland. I, I did live a few years in Scotland, in Glasgow. Um, and the second island was Japan. So I will be living seven years in Japan before moving to Australia. <laughs> Australia is the third one, right? But pretty big one. Well, I, so I wouldn't what, call Australia I, um, an island, but yeah. <laughs> Right, right. So tell us, um, what are you finding challenging? Because you work um, a lot in the business space and a lot with women and uh, you do coaching, you uh, inspire other people. How has it been for you uh, this, this last few months? Certainly. Um, from my personal perspective, I would say um, that I think I'm lucky that life prepared me for what's actually coming. Um, for the past seven years, I was in charge of APAC region managing and, co and working with virtual teams. So for me, going online, it was a natural move. Um, and thanks to this one, actually, I had the space to be more supportive and, and give help to those in need. So as you mentioned, I'm, I'm also working on coaching. So uh, when the crisis came, I started working with our Polish community here in, in Australia, where I offered my, my free services to, to support those in crisis, right? When, when the whole situation happened, uh, a number of people lost the job. Um, what happened is that they, uh, they became very stressed. They didn't know what's going to happen. Um, they, they start panicking. So from my perspective, um, because for me, the situation was under the control, I could actually give myself to those uh, that needed. And what I could say, say is that there were quite a number of people who needed the support. So being outside of the home country, being in Australia as an emigrant, as, as uh, the previous speaker mentioned, uh, people are actually not yet in this dreamland. Uh, they face mm -hmm. way more challenges that uh, they expected to, do, to face. And was there anything that um, surprised you in particular about um, what, what's been happening? Uh, yes. Um, so as someone who was born in Poland during the communism time, uh, honestly, I never, ever, ever, ever thought that I will ever see empty shelves, that I will see the panic in, in, in people's eyes in the shops uh, about what's going to happen, how am I going to feed my family. So uh, that's something that surprised me. I never thought I will have to actually face it again, that I will see it again. Uh, but at the same time, I was very positively surprised with the, the way how Australia handled it, how people were actually supporting each other, um, how the, the neighborhoods were, uh, were out there for, for, for the people living here. So it was a very nice, pleasant surprise. Mm. So overall tough times though, um, but is there anything from this experience that you're going to keep? Are there any sort of silver linings um, in this, um, you know, cloud, I guess, um, or, or something that you could share with us about um, that you've changed and you're going to live it that way? Right. Uh, one of the things is the, the routine that I implemented in the past few, few months. So um, I was always kind of like a tornado coming in, coming out um, with this, this uh, thousand ideas and, and uh, activities per minute. And being locked down at home, working with my clients uh, online actually uh, forced me to, uh, to implement the routines in my daily life. And what I observed, they are extremely powerful. They actually help me um, better manage my time, better manage myself. And this is something that I would like to maintain after, uh, after uh, the entire difficult situation. Um, the other thing that helped me, and this is what I would like to share also with, with everyone, is the experience I brought from Japan, uh, is about actually finding yourself in a time, calm, calming down and, and taking the time. 
get yourself uh, the space, uh, give yourself the, the time and don't try not to get stressed. The things will pass on and, and you'll be fine. So this is something that definitely I will be also working with the other people to explain how you can enjoy the current situation despite the circumstances. So it sounds like you're a bit of an eternal optimist. Um, you, you, you believe that things will get better. <laughs> If you live, uh, if you live in seven countries, if you move from one country to another, if you work with a number of uh, cultures um, and have a daily challenges, you have to be optimist. Otherwise, you cannot have the right. So yes, I am. I believe it's going to be the better days are coming tomorrow. Right, right. Well, that's that's a very good message. Uh, with which we're going to move on to Lucina, uh, and Lucina uh, works for a. Um, you know, educational sector where there was a, there's been a lot of disruption. And we had a chat yesterday and she shared some of the challenges with me. Um, so Lucina, could you tell us um, what's happening and um, how are you pivoting? Um, let, let's use this, this word because you, you, you might potentially be looking uh, at even a change of career. I mean, who knows? Could, could you tell us um, more about that? Yeah, so a little bit like uh, what Bettina's already mentioned. Uh, so this is happening at the University of Sydney. This is happening even more at the University of in Mel or universities in Melbourne. I work for um, University, uh, specifically Monash College. So um, when uh, uh, this situation erupted in Wuhan, this is the time when this already started disrupting um, our work. So not when. Uh, we got the first case in Australia, <laughs> but when uh, Chinese got the first case in Wuhan, this is where um, my students uh, started to panic. Um, and I was a bit oblivious, thinking, oh, come on, guys, this can't be that bad. Uh, mm. But then it just became from bad to worse. And all of a sudden, I just found myself um, being like this, you know, mother hen uh, who's got two kids at home and 18 in the classroom and uh, all of a sudden I needed to um, uh, increase because we always do um, a lot of the uh, pastoral care when we are teachers um, but most of our job is obviously focusing on teaching and educating those kids and preparing them for what's coming uh, but in that particular um, time when it all started um, the, the, this, this, there was a massive shift in uh, what my uh, focus uh, needed to be so I needed to be more the mother and I needed to sort of put myself in uh, the shoes of the parents uh, the Chinese parents uh, who uh, sent those kids over here just before Christmas and found out right after Christmas uh, that they cannot come back to China anytime soon because this um, this pandemic, uh, well, back then it wasn't really pandemic as yet, but this, this uh, virus um, started spreading. And then when uh, we found the first case in Melbourne, these parents started panicking even more. Um, obviously, um, I think I'd, I'd be the same if my kids were on the other side of the world. Um, uh, thinking, are they really safe there? So I had to take that role of um, of the mother, of the father, ensuring them, ensuring the parents that uh, we, we've got this, we've got this. Um, it's not going to be um, a disaster. Um, initially, obviously, um, there was a lot of hate also towards the Chinese. Um, there was a lot of racial mm. um, discrimination happening because a lot of people were blaming them for bringing the virus here. Um, which was obviously not the case, but um, that, that's the first thing we had to deal with. And then when we moved to online teaching, just like Bettina mentioned earlier, um, my six hour uh, day turned into a 10 hour day uh, and my five, um, week, um, five day week turned into a seven day week. And it's been like this. And uh, at the moment we're going through the exam period, which is ext extremely stressful, not only for us, but for our students, for everyone involved. And uh, I, I totally agree with what Bettina has said earlier. Uh, it's amazing to see how in this particular moment, even though we're not making any more money and there is the perspective that we will not have a job in a couple of, uh, of months uh, and this college may not exist in six months time uh, if we don't get any new students, uh, which is a very real uh, perspective. Uh, we're still all putting in all those hours and we're putting um, those hours with the smiles, smiles on our face because we need to show those kids we've got this. 
if we show them our panic, uh, if we show them that we are in any way stressed by the situation, that would just transform um, right away and that would just end in disaster. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of pressure on, on me sort of putting the, the brave face and, and I sometimes feel that um, it's quite a lot, to be honest. Um, and there are times when I literally have to stand back and just say, okay, I need to uh, rethink this and I need to recharge the batteries and I need to face this again uh, with, a, with a fresh perspective. And uh, what we're talking about today, the agility, the resilience is what the students um, are needing or need from me at the moment. And I need to find it somewhere so I can pass it on, you know? So um, mm. yeah, it's very challenging times. And I'm glad that everyone else mentioned that this is the time for learning. This is a time to shift in, in our thinking. And I think in education, it's going to be especially tertiary education. I think it came to the point that what we were doing were wrong, was wrong. We put all the eggs in one basket. Uh, we were just basically milking those uh, international students, sorry for the expression. Um, thinking that's going to last forever um, and we thought you know the, the, the innovations that we're introducing and all these new ways of teaching are absolutely amazing um, but at the moment they're not uh, mm. so uh, all of this uh, we were not prepared for for sure uh, we've never ever thought that we'd be teaching English or preparing uh, students uh, for the university courses online it's not easy. Um, I'm a bit like Monica from Sydney, um, a little pocket rocket, they call me. And all of a sudden I have to sit on my bum uh, for most of my day, <laughs> which is very difficult. Um, but I reckon uh, at the end of the day, uh, we're going to see a light um, at, at the end of this tunnel and we will have to shift. We will have to change careers. We will have to change the way we think about education. We will have to change the way we do things. Um, mm -hmm. and you know uh, as polish women um i think we can do that we can do that we haven't done we have done a lot we haven't done anything uh like that before but uh still the challenge is what we uh always uh take on and i've never seen um a polish woman matka polka we say polish mother <laughs> crumbling under the pressure so i reckon um uh, i've got this positive um uh, perspective, just like Aga, uh, that things will um, change and will change for better someday, one day. Okay. So before I um, uh, move on to uh, ask Monica some difficult questions, I just wanted to thank you, Lucina, for sharing that because it mustn't be easy. So we all, um, you know, trying to hold it together, and um, you know, I, I certainly put a lot of not that I put a positive spin, but I'm, I'm you know, my work and um, uh, private life has blended, like there's no start and there's no end. And I think what you've talked about just really resonated with me because you, you not only have your students, you not only have your family, but you have like 7,000 Polish people on your Facebook page, right? <laughs> and they, <laughs> they come That's to you with every single... Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, so well, I think... Yeah. So, sorry, so, sorry so I'll just say... Yeah, go on. I'll just finish on that. So this is a very similar situation to what uh, Monica, our council, is experiencing. Because uh, those people, before they uh, get to you with their frustrations, they 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 spill the frustration <laughs> on Facebook to start with. So uh, yeah, it's a lot of work. I have to moderate a lot of. Um, uh, you know, uncensored language, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but it's another layer and these people do need um, that sort of platform and these people need someone uh, to uh, to talk to or someone to express their thoughts and views on um, certain things that are going on around them and they look for, for support and help there as well. Hmm. We're very, very lucky to, to have it. Yeah, we're very lucky yeah. to have you, uh, Lucina. So, Monica, um, we've already mentioned that you work as a barrister, so a very important job. But um, equally important is your um, is your directorship of um, the Polish Festival, and we all turn up, you know, in November. I think it's second Sunday every every November or something like that. And it's a fantastic day, but there must be so much work going on behind the scenes. Could, could you tell us more about what, what happens? Firstly, why did you get involved being a you know, third generation Pole 
Um, are, uh, are the Polish traditions sort of uh, very much supported in, in your home or um, how did you get involved? Uh, yes, the Polish traditions are very much supported in the home. Um, so I'm grateful to my mama and my tata, my mum and dad for passing those traditions on. Also uh, with working parents who ran their own business, inevitably we uh, spent a lot of time with our, our bachelor and our judge, so uh, had the benefit of their traditions. Uh, being passed on and I suppose my reason for involvement well, probably began as a child because uh, it was an interesting activity to do and then being sent to Hatzelstwo and Polon there's the Polish dance group a number of other sort of um, Polish activities uh, you met people who had similar experiences to you so were the one that always sticks in my head is being sent to school with um, a sandwich made of rye bread filled with pickles that was very, very different to the peanut butter and jam on white or ham and cheese if people were being crazy sort of school, uh, being crazy at school. <laughs> so having that experience uh, and being able to share that experience with people that were also sent to school with rye sandwiches uh, gave me the opportunity to understand my culture a little bit more and the culture of my grandparents. And the reason I stayed involved uh, in the Polish culture is because I oddly enough described myself as Polish. I mean, my, my maiden name was Pashkiewicz, so I needed an explanation um, because that's quite difficult for people uh, in Australia to say. Uh, so um, I, I, stay, I stayed involved in the Polish culture because it's a, it's a culture that my, my grandparents fought for and uh, fought to maintain when they left the country out of for no choice of their own. Um, so, you know, the, my grandparents on my grandmother and my parent, grandparents on my uh, father's side were deported to Siberia. My grandfather came through Germany. Uh, it was not an easy journey for them. Nevertheless, once they found themselves on the other side of the world in a country that they'd never even heard of, uh, they fought to maintain that culture and that heritage. And I, I sort of uh, consider it uh, an honour, but also an onus to maintain that help culture here for not only for recent immigrants, but also for people whose stories are similar to mine, so second generation, third generation. Uh, in terms of the work that goes on for the Polish Festival, it is enormous. <laughs> it's, a, it's quite a lot of work. Uh, uh, thankfully, I have a very, very good committee that supports me, full of volunteers. Everyone who does it, does it out of the goodness of their heart. We're also we often get uh, shock from stakeholders and sponsors uh, when they realise that no one's paid for the work that they do, but um, we all do it because we see the importance of having one festival in Melbourne that is for the Polish community, but also for the Melbourne community. So I think what distinguishes our festival from um, mm -hmm. other community festivals within the Polish community is that uh, our aim is to bring a taste of Poland to Melbourne. So to bring a taste of Polish culture to uh, a broader Australian community, uh, because there is so much to share about the Polish culture that is fantastic and brilliant and simply unknown this far, you know, this far on the other side of the world. So to be able to bring that to so many people for so long, uh, it's a lot of work, but it certainly is. It's it's a pleasure. It really is. Right, right. And what about your day job, uh, Monica? You work as a, as a barrister. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a tough job. Uh, what, what has changed? Um, are, are you working? Um, are you still going to courts? What, what's, what's been happening? Uh, I think um, the courts have been obviously are not immune, and the legal system is not immune to the impacts of COVID. But uh, it has been, as Anna was talking about, um, this provides an opportunity every sort of adversity provides an opportunity and uh, in my opinion it has done so for the legal profession so you wouldn't have thought that the legal profession is one that was traditionally thought of as agile um, or able to move very quickly or adapt very quickly but um, and, and indeed there's been discussions for decades about the need to bring the legal profession in touch with technology and to embrace technology as part of the legal profession but there has always been this fear about change and there's always been this fear mm. about uh, straying from the known and what COVID has done has forced us to stray from the known so 
most of the hearings are online now. Um, judges are having to use online platforms, WebEx, uh, team, Microsoft Teams, Zoom in some cases. Um, they're having to use those to conduct hearings. Some hearings are having to be conducted in person just by the nature of them. Um, and some hearings unfortunately aren't able to run. So ones with uh, jury trials is just simply unfeasible to do with that much technology. Um, it provides its uh, own challenges. So sometimes, you know, just by the nature of technology, some things can, if a hearing was listed for a day, it might take three days because all it takes is for a bad internet connection. And then, um, mm. you know, 300 different qu uh, questions ends up extending it out. Um, but it has provided, I think, I, th I think it's provided an opportunity for those who were scared of embracing technology because they were concerned that uh, it would fundamentally change our justice system. Uh, it's provided them with a level of trust to see that this does work, not for everything. Uh, there is a place in our justice system for jury trials and they, they can't be conducted online. They simply can't. But other things that can be conducted online, I think, will continue into the future. I think mm. the court now has the technology and the faith that these this this is an an efficient way of conducting litigation, which is the most um, I suppose the biggest issue with conducting litigation in Australia is inefficiencies and the costs mm. associated with those efficient inefficiencies. So you probably think, uh, and as many other people do, that some of these efficiencies will continue to be to be applied, or we, we're going to get better at technology. And because uh, technology is also so stressful, I don't I don't know whether you guys find this, but like even before this session with practice, and we, you know, like I, I took um, maybe three hours to set everything up because I was paranoid that things aren't going to work because they often don't, right? Mm -hmm. And I think um, it's really interesting that uh, we, we've progress so much in so many different areas but we yet to catch up in many others and one of the things that we need to catch up is um and you know we, we we're not uh, i'm not a uh, digital native but i'm pretty okay with a lot of things but there are so many so many so many, many people that aren't there's literacy issues there's uh inability to use technology the way that we can so I think there'll be uh, that. That's a revolution. I think that um, Anna, I think may, may may be mentioned that we need to come on that journey and we need to drag um, uh, everybody along. And not all of it is fantastic either, because you know to lose the human touch and and all of that. You know that's a concern for a lot of people. I, I would think. Um, you, would you believe that we've been uh, online for an hour? So we have to wrap up, even though it's fascinating, loving it. So Monica, I will ask you one last question. And that is May, 14th of May, 2021. What are we seeing? Uh, it's me. So uh, first of all, uh, I agree with all ideas of, to be positive, although difficult, very difficult times for everybody uh, because as I said at the beginning nobody was prepared for uh, coronavirus and um, what uh, what I would like to recommend for everybody is uh, like Anna said that please find your time to for yourself uh, I promised myself in a very difficult time when I, of course, um, ha uh, has had some thoughts that I will do something for myself when we come back to normal, to normal times. First of all, maybe I will learn another foreign language <laughs> or do okay. something, uh, something uh, even at my age, uh, I would like to learn something new, or not only uh, new technologies, but um, I would like to say only that um, uh, for um, Lucina, uh, for your uh, Facebook or uh, <laughs> web page or something like that, please send all the people to our professional web page because of the fake news. Uh, about the transport, about the possibilities. Sometimes we need to explain them so simple things. Everything is on our webpage. I prepared 
between the tales with other consuls, the special information, even the special letters to help them to leave Australia. So please send them there. Uh, and I would like to say something uh, for me very important. After pandemic, I hope that we remember that first and foremost, we all are all human beings with feelings and we cannot forget basic human values like respect, compassion and kindness. And as humans, we need another human to exist. I hope that in May, we will be still full of life, and full of feelings, good feelings, human beings. And, um, and, and I would like to say something in Polish. Chciałabym zobaczyć człowieka w człowieku. Very inspirational. That's, that's, my, that's my motto for uh, 2022. Wow. Wonderful, wonderful. And I'll hand over to you now um, with a similar question. And perhaps if you could frame it around, um, you know, business and leadership in uh, what well, leadership in the business context, I guess, <clears throat> is what I'm asking whether you could do. And, and just think forward, what, 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 what's likely to happen? I mean, if you had a crystal ball in, in the next 12 months, what, do you, what, what are we seeing, do you think? I know it's a difficult question, Sarah. Uh, yes, indeed, it is. But um, it's always obviously hard to, after such a beautiful words and um, such a great sentence that um, uh, Ms. Council just shared with us, that it's so important to find a human being in ourselves to really reflect about what's going on in the next 12 months. So very strongly, I would start with the business first and then probably reflect what does it mean for us um, here in Australia. Um, so probably um, we all do see the news and the predictions for the next couple of months. Um, particularly here in Australia, we will be uh, probably experiencing uh, a business slowdown. It has been predicted before COVID-19 and COVID-19 obviously is going to extend um, and make it probably a bit longer. So the first possible signs uh, are expected somewhere at the end of uh, 2020 and probably we will recover somewhere around 2021. That's what the smart people are saying and spend a lot of time reading and predicting the future. It's not me. I cannot tell that, uh, but it's my knowledge. What I can say uh, from my experience is that in the next couple of months, we will be slowly returning back to the offices and to our workplaces. But we probably in the next 12 months will never come back in the same way as we would imagine to old world. I don't really believe that we're going to have old world. I think the world's going to change um, because for the first couple of months, still uh, we won't find a vaccine. We will be still uh, practicing social distancing, which is an interesting and new experience for all of us. Um, later on, I would expect that we're going to see some uh, significant changes, particularly in the real estate and the way we organize our offices, the way we organize, the way we, um, we serve people, but also the way we you know, eat and, um, and enjoy our leisure time. So that's probably something that we hear, what we see, and what's the prediction from The Economist. I think for me personally, um, I'm very much excited and I really, really cannot wait when I can finally see my team in person, when I can finally spend time with them. Um, but I'm also um, very conscious and I'm very much aware that at the time that it's given to us now, is given for a reason. And I really hope that each of you will dedicate that time to find something that makes you really happy. So if I have this um, uh, one more sentence to wish you something, I wish each of you to find time to re reconnect with yourself, reconnect with your family, with your friends, and find happiness. I think it is an opportunity for us to be, um, to redefine ourselves again. Yeah, wow, thank you. Bettina, what's the new normal um, gonna look like, uh, do you think? Just very globally, you mean, or any specific focus you would like to do new normal? How, how about it's up to you? Tell us, tell, tell okay. us whatever comes to mind. I think 
you know, there, there are some very, some very engraved behavior in people that I think much will not change. Uh, and, and I had, you know, a good love with a good Italian friend of mine uh, because the moment, you know, the, some of the social distancing requirements were lifted last week weekend, she came over and gave me a big hug and, you know, was back herself and, and you know, embracing physical contact at the full end. And I thought, you know, some things will never change. Um, at the same time, I think what is going to, you know, the new normal be, I think there will be many smarter ways in which we're going to work. I think that we have realized that there is a lot of, you know, waste and noise that we are producing and we can live without it. And I think there is this, you know, I, I have someone who sent it to me recently, rethinking what we are going to allow to let in back into our lives when in many ways our lives reopen. And maybe the busyness that we've been used to, maybe the, you know, preoccupation with everything and anything, maybe now we will be more selective as to what are going to be the choices and, and priorities. So I think the I want to hope that the new normal will be a little bit more meaningful in some way, because all of us have a lot of time to rethink the purpose of everything we do. And I think that that's a positive thing the new normal hopefully will, will be looking like. That's a very positive auto. I think this positivity was something that emanated from all of us uh, today. Yes, uh, very much um, a common thread. Uh, thank you, Bettina. Aga, what do you think? Um, we catch up again at 10 p.m., 14th of um, May, 2021. What are we going to be talking about? Well, um, I, I really do hope that for many, many people, impossible will actually become possible, right? So I think what we've learned in 2020 about uh, remote work being actually able to be conducted, about the ability to build and deepen the relations we have with, with our friends, with our family, with, with our business partners, is possible um, that it is important to actually take uh, the time for ourselves and take care of our inner selves. So I really do hope that um, the 2021 uh, will be a lesson which we're not gonna waste. Um, I'm a little bit afraid that uh, we we might just jump into our uh, our new lives, which we remember from three months ago, um, forgetting about what happened, and we're just gonna enjoy the uh, the current days. But um, yeah, again, let's be positive that uh, 2021 is gonna be a good year, full of new experiences, full of new opportunities, and what's more, people. Who are brave enough to uh, to reach them, to to chase them, and and go for them? Amazing, really inspirational. I'll um, shift our focus onto Lucina, who's been talking about leadership in a very gutsy. I I, I have to say that um, you know your your little presentation there really inspired me. Um, what's in store for you and your on and your Facebook page and your students and and your kids and and your community? Because you. It's such a, you know, positive, like it emanates from you. Um, what do you think is ahead of us? I just, um, I believe and I hope um, this will happen, uh, that we will learn to appreciate um, the little things that we took for granted a little bit more. So um, uh, in the past, for example, if we had, you know, 10 different um, uh, Polish events happening in uh, in Melbourne in one month, people would be complaining, oh, why do we have this? Or, I don't want to go to that. I don't want to go to that. Too many, or this is not fun, or this is too far away. I think we're going to appreciate, uh, like it was in the past, like in the 80s, you know, when people could go to the Polish club and meet with a few friends and have that Polish um, sub and and beer and whatever. We're going to appreciate that again uh, a little bit more. We're going to appreciate that coffee with friends. We're going to appreciate the fact that we can go for a hike together, um, that sort of thing. And 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 just hope that uh, this will uh, continue not only in 2021 but for 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 the rest of our lives because that's ultimately what we are going to be showing to uh, our kids as well, um, that this is, uh, which Monica was referring to, this is uh, our culture and in our culture, this is what we do. Uh, and if we appreciate that uh, every single time we experience that, 
uh, our children will appreciate that too. So I just hope that this is uh, what's going to happen with my students. I really don't know. I'm, I'm imagining myself teaching a very small class of maybe eight, <laughs> not 18. <laughs> uh, that would be great, um, giving them a bit more attention um, and hopefully not being overtired because of that. So um, yeah, that's my perspective for future. Thank you. And Monica, they in Melbourne, um, before we uh, imagine um, 14th of May 2021, let's go to November 2020 because the festival's happening as planned. Is that right? That's that's the plan. Um, are you going to be agile and resilient? Is my question. Uh, uh, I think we have to be. I mean, hopefully. I was just thinking about if you're going to ask me what happened in May 2021. Ah. And then hopefully everyone has been enjoying a, a lovely festival on the 20th of, uh, of the, the 17th of November 2020. But um, the plan at this stage is for the festival to proceed. And I think that's because we have an obligation for it to proceed. Uh, as, mu as much of a pleasure as it is to run the festival, uh, its, its job is to promote Polish culture in Australia. And we have to promote... We have to provide, um, we have to be that light at the end of the tunnel that Lutzina was talking about. We provide that opportunity. Uh, we have an obligation, in my view, to our storeholders who are predominantly small businesses, recent immigrants who brought, uh, started small businesses like food trucks or jewellery businesses, um, bringing over, that are based on their culture, bringing that culture uh, across. So um, we have an obligation, in my view, to those small businesses who are doing it pretty tough in Australia um, and I imagine all over the world. Uh, and we have an obligation to be, uh, in my view, a positive uh, example of resilience and fortitude rather than giving up completely. So rather than saying, well, you know, too hard, I'll handball that to a future date, uh, in my view, it's it's our obligation to show that um, this is something important that we can mould um, to fit whatever the obligations are that are imposed by the government, uh, social distancing, those sort of mm. things. But we need we need to show flexibility and we need to show our resilience, which um, in my mind is. Uh, Sort of a cornerstone of not only leadership but also of Polish DNA. I think we're a pretty, pretty resilient uh, bunch that's bred into our, bred into our bones. So uh, that's the aspect of Polish culture that we're going to, uh, to to show off this year is our resilience. Yeah, and I don't think we could uh, finish this session uh, any better than what you've just said. So thank you. And we look forward to attending the festival, supporting the festival and being there and enjoying all of that you've mentioned. And um, at, at a personal level, I just wanted to thank you all for, for being part of this. And I know it was a last minute mad um, idea um, and you have no idea really truly how much I appreciate that you've not only stayed up um, till you know 11 o'clock uh, even though everyone's really busy and tired and uh, possibly grumpy um, so um, I really have learned so much and I feel that we are connected and I, I'm hoping that what we just did um, tonight will um, make waves out there, you know. Yes, we are 16,000 kilometers away, but look at what a powerhouse, what, a, what an amazing strength. Um, and, um, you know, how much sort of raw emotion, vulnerability, but but also positivity. And I wanted to thank each and every one of you. So Anna, Monica from Melbourne, Pani Monica from Sydney, Lucina, Bettina and Aga, thank you so, so, so very much. Um, I hope to see you in person soon enough, but if not, we're going to do it again next year, right? Yes, <laughs> okay. Thank so you. I'll, I'll hand over to the organisers, which are not far away. And once again, thank you and um, have a good night, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> See you. Good night. Thank you. See ya. See you. Tak, szanowni państwo. Uh... Nie wiem, czy mnie słychać. Halo.
To tak, Państwo, tak, tak, ja tak. Z, już z Polski bardzo serdecznie dziękuję i pozdrawiam wszystkie Panie. Dzisiaj panel mocno zfeminizowany, ale wspaniała energia od Pani płynie. Ja przeszedłem już na język polski, dlatego że, że tak naprawdę nadajemy z Polski z, dzięki gościnności Centrum Wystawniczo-Kongresowego G2 Arena w Jasiące koło Rzeszowa, która nas gości. Halo Australia dzisiaj na Państwa ekranach, dzięki również technologii online i internetowi. Dziękujemy serdecznie naszym wspaniałym panelistkom. Dziękujemy Pani Ewie za, za moderację i przedstawienie, przeprowadzenie dzisiejszego panelu. Szanowni Państwo, to jeden, to już czwarty, czwarty odcinek naszego cyklu konferencji. Wcześniej była Hiszpania, Wielka Brytania, Stany Zjednoczone. Przypomnę również, że całą dzisiejszą konferencję, która była prowadzona w języku angielskim, już niebawem udostępnimy również z transkrypcją na język polski. Zachęcam więc do śledzenia naszego profilu Kongres 60 milionów na Facebooku. Natomiast już teraz również Państwa zaproszę na kolejne konferencje i kolejne formaty w jeden na jeden, gdzie będziemy przedstawiać konkretne osoby w formacie 60 million people oraz format biznesowy 60 million economy, gdzie będziemy dyskutować o tematach gospodarczych na wskroś przez cały świat, również dzięki Polonii mieszkającej tak daleko jak właśnie w Australii. Bardzo serdecznie dziękuję wszystkim Paniom Prelegentom za dzisiejsze spotkanie i cóż, widzimy się już za tydzień na kolejnym spotkaniu w ramach kongresu 60 milionów. Niestety z uwagi na sytuację na świecie w stylu online, ale miejmy nadzieję, że dzięki temu również poszerzymy sferę kontaktów, aby już kiedyś się to wszystko skończy, spotkać się również na upragnionym spotkaniu w Realu, na kongresach 60 milionów, na globalnym zjeździe Polonii, gdzie integrujemy się nie tylko osobiście, ale również gospodarczo i walczymy o to, aby jak najlepiej funkcjonować na całym globie jako Polacy i Polonia. Dziękujemy serdecznie, do zobaczenia już niebawem. Do zobaczenia, do zobaczenia. Zapraszamy do Australii, zapraszamy do Australii.